I'm delighted today to be joined in the downtown den by Roger Marsh. Roger is the chair of the Local Enterprise Partnership for the Leeds City Region. He also chairs something called MP11, Northern Powerhouse 11, which he'll explain to us in a moment. And I'm also going to be discussing with Roger how he sees us coming out of this with some optimism and positivity, and also a recent devolution deal that was announced for the Leeds City Region West Yorkshire area by the government uh, in uh, Rishi Sunak's first budget. Roger, delighted that you can join us. Thanks for finding time. Yeah, great, great to be with you. Nice to see you all and uh, and be able to hopefully, yeah, in these challenging times, actually, hopefully a note of uh, realistic optimism. Yeah, that'd be good. And And Roger, just before we get into the detail of the conversation, explain to people watching what the MP11 is. The MP11 is, is the group of 11 local enterprise partnerships, which as your announcement suggested, I'm the chair of the Leeds City Region one. It covers the whole of the North. And the objective is that the 11 of us working, as we do in partnership in our local geographies with both the private sector and the public sector, and all social, you know, the, the social enterprises, HE, et cetera, we actually bring together thinking at a northern level, think things where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And actually, it's very important that we keep remembering that the north, and, and we often are guilty of this in the north, of perhaps describing ourselves as a problem, moaning about we haven't had this, we haven't had that, rather than actually what we have to offer. What we, and I think this is a great opportunity for us to up our game on the offer we make to the recovery of UK PLC, rather than that continued gripe. So our approach has been, look at the big things at a northern level, we could do together collaboratively and uh, cohesively, uh, as well as the work we're doing at, 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 a, at a local, each of our local levels. And again, let's not lose sight of the fact if the North was a country on its own, it'd be in the top, well, pre-COVID, the top 25 economies in the world. So not such a, not such a small thing, not such a dog, but actually quite an opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that the thing that always strikes me about you, Roger, whenever we speak, is that you've definitely a glass half full sort of guy. And that's the approach that you've taken in terms of the role that you've got within the Leeds City region. And I suppose that, you know, you look at this from a LEP perspective, very much it's a strategic organisation, a strategic body. But inevitably, I suppose, you've been drawn into doing some reactive things in recent times because of the situation we find ourselves in. Yeah, I, I guess, you know, as I say, it is a unique partnership between the private and the public sector. Ne neither one of those parties has all the right answers, but actually together we can get more of them than doing it individually and, and using that convening power. And I think one of the things that I'm really pleased about how NP11's uh, developed particularly as there are many voices that represent the North and have a view, but actually NP11 not only is, has been set up by the government and funded by the government, but actually has taxpayer money to do stuff. So we have the means by which we can uh, deliver things. Um, and as I've said before, it is, a, it is important that we present the offer the North makes, and that hopefully then helps people understand the size and shape of the asks. That uh, and, and that'll be true coming out of out of this. It was interesting that um, on a call I was on last week with Grant Shapps, who's obviously now the, the cabinet member representing the Northern Powerhouse amongst a variety of other things, and he was very clear: the North has a big part to play in this for the UK going forward. And I genuinely believe that wasn't just a, a political nicety; that was a genuine statement of intent. And I think, as I say, that's why not half full just for the hell of it, half full for good reason. Yeah. So if you look at what the government have announced in recent weeks, Roger, they've clearly done a huge amount to prop up business, to support business through these challenging times. Now, inevitably, that's going to mean uh, a big bill to the exchequer yep. at the end of all this. Now, you've been an important advocate of hs2 and northern powerhouse rail uh, i suppose one of the fears coming out of this is that the government may be tempted to uh, to forgive the pun put a brake 
on some of that mm. big infrastructure spending around transport. I'm sure you're on the same page as I. I think that would be a mistake. But equally, from what I'm hearing, the governments are actually going in the opposite, opposite direction. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, they have already announced that HS2 must, must crack on. Yep. And indeed, um, the Secretary of State for Transport has said, and how do we make NPR happen sooner? Right. I think this is where you have to strike the balance between the here and now and the eye of the storm, whether it be a health one or an economic one, but actually the, hopefully, not calmer waters later, but actually the medium to long term. You know, we need to be visionary, like, and forgive me for using something like Brunel, but we need to see the long game here, yeah. uh, and as well as actually the steps we take are part towards that long game, even though we're in the eye of the storm or the fire. And uh, so I think those infrastructure investments will still be needed. They may have to change, they may have to adjust. Um, but again, if you're going to unlock the full potential of the North, as I said it earlier, you've got to put the enabling connectivity in. And that's not just digital, although digital is very important. And we know how valuable that's been in the last few weeks. You know, we couldn't have survived. Couldn't be doing this without it, for example. Um, but we also need that physical connectivity because it's not just about us here on this island or in this country. It's about those who increase and we want them to come and visit us here and not just enjoy our countryside and our coastal, but actually invest in what is an exciting economy. And beyond the transport connections and HS2 Northern Powerhouse Rail, because clearly they've been big ticket items in terms of the Northern Powerhouse ask. Where are the other areas where you think we can begin to make some progress moving forward? Skills and productivity, I know, has been high on the local enterprise partnerships agenda right across the north. And I suppose the other area that we'd want to look at is how we can uh, continue to, uh, the sector that you've just mentioned, Roger, digital and tech, vitally important to Leeds and the city region there, but across again, the whole of the North. Any particular things, measures that you'd like to see happen post COVID-19? Yeah, I, I would actually say that, first of all, people might remember something called the Northern Powerhouse Independent Economic Review, which was a few years ago, but identified some prime capabilities of the North, one of which was digital, one of which was health technology as well, kind of, Interesting. Hey, let's yeah, let's yeah. just pause there and let that one sink in. Yeah. But in, when it comes to changing, uh, I think our attitude to innovation and entrepreneurship, um, I think the North has a lot to learn, but importantly, has a lot to offer. I think one of the things I've learned being involved in this <clears throat> agenda for the last seven years is that supporting SMEs just to do a bit better, or progressively better <clears throat> isn't enough of a solution. We need something that's not just about an improved gradient, but something of a hockey stick. Mm. And that's why some of the work we've been doing in Leeds City Region, which is now being ruled out nationally, but quite a lot in the North with MIT, what's called MIT REAP, where it's all about how to create conditions where people who've got good ideas can bring them forward, find out they're no good, bring some more forward and get the funding so that we end up with you know, world-class, globally significant businesses, some of which you can't even imagine now. Yes. But, but if I take you back, imagine somebody coming along to me saying, I've got this idea, it's called Windows, and I'm looking at it thinking, <laughs> well, what, what's, the, what, what's that all about? And, and the rest is history. And it's about having more of that. But I think there's another thing where we've got to change our mindset to our attitude to risk and failure. Mm. But actually, we need to be a bit riskier not ridiculous, remember, if we, particularly if it's public money, we've got to be accountable for it, especially when there's going to be less of it about. And, and secondly, uh, the fact, actually, not everything does work, and, and that's okay, yeah. as long as we get some major successes out of it. And you know, again, the North is full of that. You know, think of the things that have been invented in the North that are gl of global significance. You know, I think about my own little city region and an undergraduate when something called the hip, hip the artificial hip was invented. Well, that's, that wasn't invented in Los Angeles or in Silicon Valley. That was invented up here in the North, yeah. as an example. Yeah. And just let's stick a bit closer to home, Roger, and Leeds, because, you know, it's a city that we've been operating in for almost 10 years now, would you believe? 
And I think it's taken, you know, the health sector and the digital sector, uh, took them as priority areas for growth, starting to see some dividends from that now. And of course, one of the big exciting initiatives that are happening this year is Channel 4 coming to town. Um, yep. What are the sort of opportunities that that type of uh, activity opens up? What, what will that act as a catalyst for, for the Leeds and wider city region, do you think? Uh, can I just contextualise it? A challenge the North has had over the last 10 or more years is about brain drain. Yes. About creating talent in our world-class universities and it all having, it all means down south yeah. uh, and because actually that's where the bright lights have felt what we need to do is say, actually how do we create conditions where the talent we create can stay and enjoy as much of the benefits of going south and maybe more up north and that's true of Leeds City Region. Leeds City Region with its nine universities produces more STEAM graduates, science, technology, engineering, arts and maths than anywhere else other than the south but most of them have gone elsewhere. So we need to do, people like me and my counterpart, leps across the north, create conditions where inward investment, either within the UK or from overseas, addresses those shortfalls between creating talent and keeping them in the region, the job opportunities. And Channel 4 is such a classic example of that. Channel 4 itself is important, but it's actually what it does to the wider creative and digital infrastructure. They'll bring about three to 400 jobs we believe the wider economic impact is many thousands of jobs measured in a billion or two over time. And that also shifts the center of activity from the south to the north. And this is not about north versus south. This is about north and south and Midlands. How do we get leveling up the new phraseology, but actually better balance, portfolio balance in terms of what UK PLC you know, offers rather than the South having to keep working ever faster for us up north to not perform to our full potential. So the digital arena is true, but also so, so is the advanced manufacturing. And I think this is one of the things where NP11 has matured that says, you know what, we'll always healthily compete with each other. And the word is healthily, yeah. that's between Leeds, Manchester, Manchester, Liverpool or whatever. But we need to do something at the same time. And that's about meaningful collaboration. If, for example, when it comes to medical devices, my part of the North has a strength nationally, then let's build on that together. If another part of the North has a strength, let's build on that. And let's do that in a, a, a cohesive way. And I think that's going to be the word coming out of this recovery for me that we need to keep going back to is, are we coherent in our approach? Are we lined up? This isn't about who's going to do better and who's going to do uh, worse. It's about how to make UK PLC a real winner, albeit starting from a, an even more challenging fiscal and, and, and economic uh, position. And you made the point earlier in the conversation, Roger, that if the North was a country, it would be uh, in the top 30. And 25. Uh, what, 25, 25. I said. Uh, and it's, actually, course, it's actually 20 seconds to be precise. Well, that's not too bad, is it, really? Um, and I, I suppose that the thing I'd say there, Roger, is that if you're talking to international investors, as I know you do often, they would see the North geographically as a place where you can't go and discuss legitimately mm. business across that sort of geographical spread. Because particularly when you're talking to countries like China and the United States, it's nothing for them, is it, in terms of transport yeah. connections, links from Manchester, Leeds, Liverpool, up to Newcastle. They, they don't see that as the challenge that we see it as. Yeah, and that's why I made the point, I made a point earlier, about us being mature enough and, and cohesive enough to present ourselves as a unified front rather than it's an East to West Pennines debate. You know, yeah. the War of the Roses was a long time ago. Let's, let's, let's not keep it alive and well. But I, I made that point. But that's, again, coming back to the manifesto of the North, which in collaboration with the Convention of the North, so again, the private sector, the public sector, and all the people who believe in the North as a solution, not a problem, 
as I said, we've got to stop presenting ourselves as, or giving people the excuse that we describe ourselves as a problem, so let's forget them, they're the troublemakers up there. Quite the contrary, that we're an opportunity. Yeah. And we said in that manifesto, one of the five asks was, can we be more in charge of our own destiny when it comes to trading and with investments so that we can present ourselves cohesively uh, together rather than, oh, what, what day of the week is it in some faraway place? Oh, it must be Leeds visiting today. And, oh, next week Sheffield's coming. Oh, and, oh Liverpool haven't been recently. You know, that's, that's interesting, but it's actually suboptimal. And what NP11 is all about how can we do things at a northern level that are optimal as compared to what we do at a local level? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I also mentioned, Roger, in my introduction that Leeds have finally got a devolution deal agreed with the other parts of West Yorkshire. Again, I know that that's something that you've been keenly involved in putting together, and I think that the conversations have been uh, perhaps longer than you would have hoped for, if I can put it that yes, way. Yes, yes, a long time. Um, and of course, during that time, uh, as you say, rightly, there's not competition um, where there doesn't have to be, but nonetheless, there is still some city competition around areas where there needs to be. And of course, what Manchester and Liverpool have benefited from, and I think it's been apparent in the last few weeks, are those strong champions for their regions yeah in Andy yeah. Bell and Steve Rotherham. And again, when you and I have discussed this in the past, that's one of the key elements of a devolution deal, isn't it? To have that champion for your city region that can go and knock on the door of number 10 and be seen as the legitimate voice for that particular geographical location. Yeah. So you must be delighted that that deal's finally been signed off. I, I, am, I am from a number of perspectives. I am obviously from a local perspective. It's long overdue. And actually, if you take Leeds City Region, uh, as a microcosm of the whole UK, it has all of the facets, whether it be financial professional services, the health agenda, manufacturing. So actually, and, and it is a fifth of the Northern House economy. So without, if it doesn't have the same tools, you're not just going to get levelling up or rebalancing. You're going to get lopsidedness. And, and that's one, been one of my concerns, not that, I don't want Greater Manchester, Liverpool, and all yours to be incredibly successful. Of course I do. But on a, on a, on again, come back to my word about coherence, a coherent way. So I am delighted. It's taken a while. Um, uh, there's no point going over how, how it, why it took so long. I guess people are fearful of some of these things. People are concerned by it. But I, again, uh, that, that leadership of an elected mayor means somebody's accountable, somebody's there working Hopefully, as, as we have today in partnership, private and public sector, neither of us have all the right answers, but together we can get most of them. Uh, and so I am quite excited about that. And, uh, and you know, I, I often remind myself of something I learned so when I was on one of the fortunate in my working life a program at Harvard about somebody asked the question, why should anybody be led by you? And I think that's one of the best questions that anybody's ever asked. So why, why should people follow? Well, because actually people have a vision people instill confidence, people are honest, people tell it how it is, but also paint a picture, people say, yeah, that's a bus I want to get on. And I think it's important, you know, at the Northern level, and we in Leeds City Region, West Yorkshire, we now have the opportunity to paint more of that picture for all, not only for the people in our part of the world, um, but also for the wider North. And the real prize, and I keep going on about it, and maybe, I hope I don't sound like the late Billy Graham, but the prize isn't the economic uplift. The prize is the social transformation. The prize is, you know, and, and forgive me to talk in medical terms, particularly with what's going on, eradication of poverty and deprivation should be our challenge as the Victorians faced typhoid, tetanus and all the others. I think that's a great message to uh, give out, Roger. You know, whilst we're striking that optimistic vision and opti optimistic note, can I just ask you where you think the uh, opportunities are going to come from once we get through this um, challenge and crisis that we're in at this moment in time? I think we both can see that the government have done uh, a good job in terms of the economics uh, of this. Don't want to get into the discussion about how things are being managed on the health side of things. Those inquests will be for other people at another time. 
But from an economic point of view, I think the Chancellor's done as good a job as we could have expected. Equally, we know that there are some sectors that are going to lag behind in terms of coming back to work, not least hospitality. And of course, visitor economy is important to your part of the world as, as much as anywhere. Um, but outside of that sector, um, which I know you guys are working hard on in terms of putting packages of support down the line to ensure that as many of them as possible do survive and come out of this. Any other areas where you think actually there's some quick wins available for us? I, I think one of the areas um, that's been evident is actually how adaptable our manufacturing businesses have been to respond to the health you know, the health supply issues and some of those business thinking, actually, am I in the right business? You know, should I be in this business going forward? I think <clears throat> is an interesting aspect. The second one is I think it'll open up the question about more onshoring. How do we you know, still be globally, uh, you know, glo operate globally or indeed has, has globalization its course, which is an interesting big question for far cleverer minds than mine. But actually, how do we how do we join up much better in terms of our supply chain? So I think those will be the opportunities. And I think the other thing, coming back to my point about MIT and people with good ideas, history tells us that after every recession, there are many, many lot startups come along. And it's being ready to prime those, I think, is important. And secondly, and unfortunately, um, there are businesses that will not survive this not because they weren't okay and doing all right, it's just they didn't have the financial or the resilience in them. And maybe they, they in time would have, would, have, uh, you know, would have failed, but this is just accelerated a bit. Uh, forgive me, it sounds a bit insensible. It was a bit like some of the people with health issues that, you know, sadly, like all of us will come to the end. It's just, it's been slightly foreshortened because of this terrible virus. Um, but we need to be realistic about that. It can't save every business, but at least we can give them all a chance. And one of the things we've been, NP11, and the LEP Network, Dashley, been pushing for is a lot of these businesses that aren't getting grants, they're in somebody else's premises, they, you know, they are important to the economy, at least give them a chance to stay alive for a while whilst we see, rather than you know, just casting them aside. So something called micro seabills that we've been pushing for. And I think the chance is beginning to announce some of these things, but you know, the country doesn't have a bottomless pit of money and we're having to strike a balance. And I guess this is a challenging time for senior politicians and all of us strike the balance between protecting everybody from this horrible pandemic, as well as preserving something of an economy that we can, we can pull out of over time uh, and then sustain ourselves uh, going forward. Yeah. Uh, and final point from me, Roger, in, in terms of the MP11's work, I know that you're close to the government and you have regular conversations with them. Um, but, you know, it's not just about dealing with this crisis here and now. You've already got one eye, if not both eyes, knowing you on the future and uh, what we can be looking to uh, as i say achieve and what opportunities and potential uh, there is um, when you cast your eye six months forward if you're able to do that at the moment you see in the continuing collaboration conversations with those international markets you've just um, referenced there that there may be a slight change in terms of globalization but nonetheless, those investors are still important to us, aren't they? And we've still got some very attractive investments for them to get involved in. Yeah, I, 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 I think it's about, it is about a reconfiguring, not, you know, closing the borders, you know, make the North great again. You know, somebody else used that phrase, which is kind of trite, really, in my view. Um, <laughs> it, it's about reconfiguring and actually being clear about actually where you have a competitive advantage going forward and where actually there's dependency uh, and, and understanding those things. Um, I think NP11 is really well placed with the government. In fact, I've just received a letter from, uh, from Simon Clark saying it's great to have a partner like NP11 in this agenda, which is good. But, but NP11 itself is a partnership of all of the 11 LEPs, themselves partnerships with all of our local authority colleagues and others. And I think that's the important 
point that we all have a, a common focus on economic and social economic extraordinary economic growth that's the new and ordinary at higher ordinary but also that solving those societal problems that that none of us want to see in our communities and you know recognizing we have a responsibility and and on that i, I kind of i said to you when we were chatting before George Bernard Shaw said something along the lines, we're not made wise by the recollection of the past, but by the responsibility for our future. And I guess that's kind of where my mind is. It's about, it's not just our future, it's for our kids and our grandkids. And say, you know, in all the certs, when people look back in 50 years, we, we gave it a good go, we did our best. Uh, and hindsight's wonderful, you know, we can rewrite all of our lives with hindsight, but it's about the foresight that's clear. And I'm very clear, the fundamentals of the North still remain. It's a question of whether we, again, revisiting all our local industrial strategies we developed, whether we need to reorganize them in a slightly different way, reprioritize as we look to the longer term recovery, uh, rather than the short term fight back. And I think it is about understanding that the short term 20 21 22 may be the fight back and then it's what happens in the medium the, the mid to, to, to longer term uh, and as i say i genuinely am optimistic but clearly there are some big challenges out there but what other choice have we got give up no no way that's not me <laughs> absolutely Roger, it's always great to speak to you. Lovely to see you looking so well and sound and as optimistic as ever. Um, we're hoping to get uh, you and a couple of the other uh, lectures together for a live event if uh, you're up for that later. Uh, sure. Yeah, brilliant. We'll be in touch and sort that out. But for the time being, Roger, great to speak and, and stay safe, mate. Yeah, and thank you for the time, Frank. You say stay safe too, you know. But above all, the North will and always will be a solution for the whole country, not just for ourselves. And let's keep, let's keep waving that flag. The great message to end with. Thanks, Roger.